Welcome back to the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour for PBS Books. We're continuing our talks with many of the authors here now, and I'm very happy now to be joined by Ron Chernow to talk about his new biography, Grant. Pleasure to be nice with to you. Nice to see you again. It's good to see because you. Because <laughs> we talked about this when it first came out. and uh, Many moons ago. <laughs> many moons ago, but you're still talking, and it's right. doing really well, really I see. Well. Yes. Let's start with what you and I were just talking about before we sat down, because today is the, the, the funeral of John McCain. Yeah, and, and I, you were watching. Yeah. And as I was watching the speeches of the various uh, former presidents, I kept thinking that Ulysses S. Grant, I think, speaks to the current moment in American political life, uh, very much the way that um, John McCain uh, did in terms of uh, patriotism, uh, yeah. military courage, a life dedicated to public service, both on the military side and the civilian side, in terms of someone who was honest and outspoken and um, just in his own quiet way was always acting for the good of the, the country. Watching the funeral, I've been here all day, so I haven't yeah. seen anything, but so what did you see in that that reminded you? You know, I found that it really um, made me feel very proud to be an American because uh, the speeches that I saw, I saw uh, President Obama, President Bush, they were really talking about American political values and culture and institution. It was really, they converted it into a classroom on the Constitution and yeah. democratic political culture. And I feel that that's so important at the moment. It also reminded me when Ulysses S. Grant um, was buried in August 1885, it became a grand pageant of national reconciliation because Grant had become the symbol of North-South yeah. reconciliation at yeah. Appomattox. So at his funeral, where there were 1.5 million uh, people, they had 1.5 million, million at people his funeral. flooded into New York City. Oh. And they had not only as the honorary pallbearers, union generals like William Tecumseh Sherman and Phil Sheridan, yeah. um, had major Confederate generals like Joseph Johnston and Simon Buckner. They had the Stonewall Jackson Brigade Confederate soldiers come up from Virginia. They had black regiments marching. So in a way, it was Ulysses S. Grant speaking to America from beyond the grave, very much the way I feel at the moment that John McCain is speaking to yeah, us from beyond yeah. the grave. Very interesting parallel. Have you seen, I mean, when you're writing a book like this, you're spending years in the heavily into right, research. Yeah. And then once it comes out, do, you, do these kind of echoes to today kind of hit you all the time? Or was this an un unusual one today. No, con constantly. You know, you never know when you're writing a book what will resonate at the moment that it comes out. Yeah. I mean, writing these books is like steering a, a super tanker, yeah, you yeah. know. It yeah. took me six years to write this yeah. book, four years of research, two years of uh, writing. So I had no idea um, of how important Grant's example in terms, of, again, of his patriotism, his, his honesty, his public service, it resonates in a very, very different way at this very kind of partisan and divisive moment in American political life. So I'm delighted that it came out when yeah. it did. I mean, some of the same issues you're writing about here are very much back with us these yes, days, and, right? And, and well, Whether it's white supremacy... Uh, absolutely. You know, in the book, I talk about really the origins of white supremacist yeah. uh, movement because, to my mind, Grant's greatest achievement as president was that he crushed the Ku Klux Klan. The yeah. Klan that's with us today was the revival of the Klan from the 19-teens and the 1920s. But when Grant was president, the Klan um, had just started in the South, was carrying on a wave of uh, terror... There was no Southern sheriff who would arrest a member of the Klan, no Southern jury that would convict a member of the Klan. Grant hired um, um, a crusading attorney general from Georgia named Amos Ackerman, yeah. who brought 3,000 uh, indictments, got 1,000 convictions against the Klan, and yeah. uh, crushed it. Yeah. And I was thinking about this. I saw the Spike Lee movie, you know, Black Klansman, where he's kind of talking about the latter-day yeah. uh, Klan. And, and Grant's story really kind of carries us back to the origins of that movement. I mean, many things in that, from Reconstruction to now. Uh, I was thinking about voting rights, too, of course. Yeah. These are all... No, and strangely the, alive, strangely I mean, very alive. much alive. You yeah. know, because significance of Grant's two-term presidencies, he was the first president um, after the passage of the 13th Amendment, 
that outlawed slavery, the 14th Amendment that guaranteed equal protection for black citizens, and most importantly, the 15th Amendment that granted voting rights yeah. uh, to black uh, males. Yeah. And it was particularly the 15th Amendment and the idea of black males voting that triggered off this violent backlash in the South in the form of the Ku Klux Klan. And there was really, in terms of uh, protecting blacks, there was a more or less complete breakdown of the criminal uh, justice uh, system because there were not hundreds, there were thousands of murders of blacks that went unprosecuted yeah. you know, until Grant came along as president and really uh, cracked down. So, alas, these issues are still... Yeah. I, I wish the book was not as relevant <laughs> as it turned out. Well, <laughs> it helps. It makes people more interested. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's good for book sales. Maybe. Yeah. Go back in time, though, uh, to because I don't remember um, us talking about this before. Like, what was it about Grant that drew you in the first place? Uh, there were a number of different things. Uh, you know, I'd always had a fantasy about doing a big, sweeping epic saga about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And Grant is really the figure that so unites. So it was the it was that era first. It, it, yeah. it was that era, and I felt particularly. You know, I've met so many Americans since the book came out who have a fantastic knowledge of the Civil War and know little or nothing about Reconstruction. And I yeah. would say to them, folks, mm -hmm. you know everything about the Civil War and nothing about Reconstruction. You walked out in the middle of the play, and the play has a surprise ending because really what happens in the South after the Civil War, Reconstruction and the collapse of Reconstruction, is that the White South manages to reverse the verdict of the, of, of the war. Yeah. Slavery was abolished, but they then institute, you know, Jim... Crow. Yeah. Uh, and so I felt that um, it's always wonderful to write about the, uh, the Civil War, but I felt that the period that Americans really needed to know about at the moment was Reconstruction. You can't, for instance, Jeffrey, to this day, you can't understand why there's a solid political South. It used yeah. to be solid Democratic yeah. South. Now it's yeah. solid Republican South. You can't understand well, that. Why without, do you, you know, I mean, this you know, is so interesting because yeah. this, is, this is an under... I'd say underreported, understudied, yeah. under, yeah. under, I don't know, under uh, known part of our history. And Why think, is that? I think do you the think? reason is that um, with the Civil War, one can emphasize the valor of both yeah. sides. One yeah. can emphasize the reconciliation yeah. at the uh, end of it. Unfortunately, the issues raised by um, Reconstruction in terms of the role yeah. of black citizens in our democracy. These are still divisive and polarizing issues. Right. So it's not surprising to me that there's a kind of amnesia, a kind of avoidance of that, because this is still, it's an open wound yeah. in the American psyche. It hasn't been healed. You know, it's interesting. So we're t it's interesting we're talking about Grant, yeah. the, the mature Grant here. Yeah. But you covered, I mean, you're, you're writing about the whole... Cradle the grave. The whole <laughs> Grant, right? <laughs> yeah. And that, and that Grant who had... A, uh, you know, a shaky reputation in many in through history, right? Yeah, and I really felt uh, Grant's two-term president for presidency uh, has been rated historically very low yeah. um, by presidential historians. In fact, in 1948, when I think they did the first of those poll rankings, right. Grant was second to last. Only Warren Harding was Is considered right? worse. But in the most recent poll, Grant was 21 of the 44 people who've been uh, president. 45. Um, and so he's moved up into the upper half. I think partly maybe the book has had some uh, influence on that. But I think that people realize that the historic emphasis was on the scandals that happened in Grant's administration. Mm -hmm. I feel that that was, uh, I don't mean to condone that, but I feel that that was in a way the minor story of his administration. He didn't participate in those scandals. He didn't condone them. Yeah. I felt the major story was what he did for in protecting the African-American community. It's kind of the more important and uh, lasting story. So the historians have focused more on that, not just in my book, but other yeah. books written about Grant in recent years. Uh, he definitely, in the stock market of historical reputations, there suddenly is a bull market yeah. in Grant shares. Yeah. How much, how much do you conclude that his being an outsider of the West, you know, not of the elite, how much did that um, shape his own character and therefore shape the way he kind of made his way into American history? 
I, I think it shaped it quite profoundly. Um, Grant had a very good um, rapport, for instance, during the Civil War mm -hmm. uh, with his soldiers. A lot of the other Union g generals were sort of very well-born and aristocratic, yeah. and the soldiers yeah. felt that they were condescending. I think that the soldiers felt that Grant was, was one of them. Uh, were inspired the idea that someone who had come from such, you know, humble beginnings could rise to yeah. general in chief and then president of the United yeah. States. And I think it certainly was a big part of his uh, bond with Abraham Lincoln because they were both outsiders from what was then considered the West. Right, right. You know, right. Il Illinois, Missouri, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, et cetera. But knowing they, the country in a way that most people did not. Didn't, and right? also both uh, Lincoln and Grant suffered from a certain East Coast condescension towards yeah. them, and yeah, I yeah. think that kind yeah. of forged part of their right. bond. Right, very important. Probably Absolutely. being underestimated too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Grant was kind of a fooler in that way. People yeah. always underestimated him, and yeah. there, there were these kind of secret hidden characters that would come out uh, at moments of stress that always surprised people. Just a, just a minute or two left here. I'm just curious about the the reception of this book. When you bring out a book, yeah, right. Um, people love a lot of the histories that you've written. Yeah. What's the reception to this one been like? Or how has it, has it made you rethink it all a little bit about people's knowledge you know, or this, interest? The in surprising thing is uh, when the book was first published, since I have a somewhat revisionist view, particularly of the presidency, yeah. that it was not a failed presidency, it was in many ways a very successful right. presidency. I felt um, since I was coming out with this revisionist view, I had imagined that there would be a lot of resistance. Frankly, I've been surprised at how little resistance there oh, has really? uh, been. Well, that's because the book is persuasive or, whether, or a statement of historical literacy. I don't know, but I would give you know, these talks and expect to get a lot of you know, uh, pushback from the uh, audience, and yet people seem to accept, if not embrace, yeah. the viewpoint of the, the book. So that that's was something interesting. of interesting. I wonder what that says about our... Uh, Openness to uh, no, good stories. I don't or, know. It, you know, it also may be. I've always had a contrarian streak in my nature. Yeah. So, for instance, when I did uh, Alexander Hamilton, this was even pre Broadway yeah. uh, musical, Hamilton was a forgotten uh, uh, yeah. person. Uh, Jefferson was glorified. Hamilton was yeah. uh, demonized. Yeah. And so I had, uh, you know, some success there in terms of asking people to take a fresh look. Yeah. So it may be that something with kind of my history and the people who had read the other books that they were yeah. you know, ready to open themselves up to another interpretation of Grant. I don't know. All right, yeah. the book is Grant, Ron Chernow. Nice to talk to you again. Pleasure Thanks as so always, much. thank you. <laughs> and do stay with us here at PBS Books. I'm Jeffrey Brown, we will be right back.